Hello, welcome back to the channel. My name is Josh and you are watching Our History. Today, we are going to focus on the Great Trek. The Great Trek, in Afrikaans de Groot Trek, was a northward migration of Dutch-speaking settlers who traveled by wagon trails from the Cape Colony into the interior of modern South Africa from 1836 onwards, seeking to live beyond the Cape's British colonial administration. The Great Trek resulted from the culmination of tensions between rural descendants of the Cape's original European settlers, known collectively as Boer, and the British Empire. It was also reflective of an increasing common trend among individual Boer communities to pursue an isolationist and semi-nomadic lifestyle away from the developing administrative complexities in Cape Town. Boers who took part in the Great Trek identified themselves as voortrekkers meaning pioneers, pathfinders in Dutch and Afrikaans. The Great Trek led directly to the founding of several autonomous Boer republics, namely the South African Republic, also known simply as the Transvaal, the Orange Free State and the Natalia Republic. It also led to conflicts that resulted in the displacement of the Northern Devele people and conflicts with the Zulu people that contributed to the decline and eventual collapse of the Zulu Kingdom. The Background before the arrival of Europeans at the Cape of Good Hope area was sparsely populated by Khoisan tribes, the Bantu tribes were still migrating south and east from present-day Lesotho. The first Europeans settled in the Cape area under the auspices of the Dutch East India Company, also known by its Dutch initials VOC, which established a victualling station there in 1652 to provide its outward bound fleets with fresh provisions and a harbour of refuge during the long sea journey from Europe to Asia. In a few short decades, the Cape had become home to a large population of Frigiden, also denoted as Frigburgers or free citizens. Former company employees who remained in the Dutch territories overseas after completing their contracts. Since the primary purpose of the Cape settlement at the time was to stock provisions for passing Dutch ships, the VOC offered grants of farmland to its employees under the condition they would cultivate grain for the company warehouses and release them from their contracts to save on their wages. Vrugbergers were granted tax-exempt status for 12 years and loaned all the necessary seeds and farming implements they requested. They were married Dutch citizens considered of good character by the company and had to commit to spending at least 20 years on the African continent, reflecting the multinational character of the VOC's workforce. Some German soldiers and sailors were also considered for Vrugberger status as well. And in 1688, the Dutch government sponsored the resettlement of over a hundred French Huguenot refugees at the Cape. As a result, by 1691, over a quarter of the colony's European population was not ethnically Dutch. Nevertheless, there was a degree of cultural assimilation through intermarriage and the almost universal adoption of the Dutch language. Cleavages were likelier to occur along social and economic lines. Broadly speaking, the Cape colonists were delineated into Boers, poor farmers who settled directly on the frontier, and the more affluent, predominantly urbanized Cape Dutch. Following the Flanders campaign and the Batavian revolution in Amsterdam, France assisted in the establishment of a pro-French client state, the Batavian Republic, on Dutch soil. This opened the Cape to French warships. To protect her own prosperous maritime shipping routes, Great Britain occupied the fledgling colony by force until 1803. From 1806 to 1814, the Cape was governed as a British military dependency whose sole importance to the Royal Navy was its strategic relation to Indian maritime traffic. The British formally assumed permanent administrative control around 1815 as a result of the Treaty of Paris. Causes. At the onset of the British rule, the Cape Colony encompassed 100,000 square miles or 260,000 square kilometers and was populated by about 26,720 people of European descent, a relative majority of whom were of Dutch origin. Just over a quarter were of German ancestry and about one-sixth were descendant from the French Huguenots, although most had ceased speaking French since about 1750. There were also 30,000 African and Asian slaves owned by the settlers 
and about 17,000 indigenous Khoisan. Relations between the settlers, especially the Boer and the new administration, quickly soured. The British authorities were adamantly opposed to the Boer ownership of slaves and what was perceived as the unduly harsh treatment of the indigenous peoples. The British government insisted that the Cape finance its own affairs through self-taxation, an approach which was alien to both the Boer and the Dutch merchants in Cape Town. In 1815, the controversial arrest of a white farmer for allegedly assaulting one of his servants resulted in the abortive Slachtersnack rebellion. The British retaliated by hanging at least five Boers for insurrection. In 1828, the Cape governor declared that all native inhabitants but slaves were to have the rights of citizens in respect of security and property ownership on parity with the settlers. This had the effect of further alienating the colony's white population. The Boer resentment of success of British administrators continued to grow throughout the late 1820s and early 1830s, especially with the official imposition of the English language. This replaced Dutch with English as the language used in the Cape's judicial and political systems, putting the Boers at a disadvantage, as most spoke little or no English. Great Britain's alienation of the Boers particularly amplified by the decision to abolish slavery in all its colonies in 1834. All 35,000 slaves registered with the Cape Governor were to be freed and given rights on par with other citizens, although in most cases their masters could retain them as apprentices until 1838. Many Boers, especially those involved with grain and wine production, were dependent on slave labor. For example, 94% of all white farmers in the vicinity of Stellenbosch owned slaves at the time, and the size of their slave holdings correlated greatly to their production output. Compensation was offered by the British government, but payment had to be received in London, and few Boers possessed the funds to make the trip. Bridling at what they considered an unwarranted intrusion into their way of life, some in the Boer community began to consider selling their farms and venturing deep into South Africa's unmapped interior to preempt further disputes and live completely independent from British rule. Others, especially Trek Boers, a class of Boers who pursued semi-nomadic pastoral activities, were frustrated by the apparent unwillingness or inability of the British government to extend the borders of the Cape Colony eastward and provide them with access to more prime pasture and economic opportunities. They resolved to track beyond the colony's borders on their own. Opposition Although it did nothing to impede the Great Track, Great Britain viewed the movement with pronounced trepidation. The British government initially suggested that conflict in the far interior of southern Africa between the migrating Boers and the Bantu peoples they encountered would require an expensive military intervention. However, authorities in the Cape also judged that the human and material cost of pursuing the settlers and attempting to reimpose an unpopular system of governance on those who had deliberately spurned it was not worth the immediate risk. Some officials were concerned for the tribes the Boers were certain to encounter, and whether these tribes would be enslaved or otherwise reduced to a state of penury. The Great Trek was not universally popular among the settlers either. Around 12,000 of them took part in the the migration, about a fifth of the colony's Dutch-speaking white population at the time. The Dutch Reformed Church, to which most of the Boers belong, explicitly refused to endorse the Great Trek. Despite their hostilities towards the British, there were Boers who chose to remain in the Cape of their own accord. For its part, the distinct Cape Dutch community had accepted British rule. Many of its members even considered themselves loyal British subjects with a special affection for English culture. The Cape Dutch were also more heavily urbanized and therefore less likely to be susceptible to the same rural grievances and considerations of those held by the Boers. Exploratory Treks to Natal In January 1832, Dr. Andrew Smith, an Englishman, and William Berg, a Boer farmer, scouted Natal as a potential colony. On their return to the Cape, Smith waxed very enthusiastic, and the impact of the discussions Berg had with the Boers proved crucial. Berg portrayed Natal as a land of exceptional farming quality, well-watered and 
and nearly devoid of inhabitants. In June 1834, the Boer leaders of Eitenacher and Grahamstown discussed a commissie track or commission trek to visit Natal and to assess its potential as a new homeland for the Cape Boers, who were disenchanted by the British rule at the Cape. Pietrus Lafras Eis was chosen as trek leader. In June 1834 at Graaf Runet, Jan Gerritse Beinkies heard about the exploratory track to Port Natal and encouraged by his father, Bernard Louis Beinkies, sent word to Eis of his interest in participating. Beinkies wanted to help re-establish Dutch independence over the Boers and to get away from British law at the Cape. Beinkies was already well known in the area as an educated young man fluent in both spoken and written Dutch and in English. Because of these skills, Ace invited Beinkies to join him. Beinkies writing skills would prove invaluable in recording events as the journey unfolded. In early August 1834, Jan Gerritse Beinkies set off with some travelers headed for Grahamstown 220 kilometers or 140 miles away. A three-week trek from Grafrenek. Sometime around late August 1834, Beinkies arrived in Grahamstown, contacted Ace and made his introductions. On the 8th of September 18 the commissie track of 40 men and one woman, as well as a retinue of colored servants, set off from Grahamstown for Natal with 14 wagons. Moving through the Eastern Cape, they were welcomed by the Tosa, who were in dispute with the neighboring Zulu king, Dingane Kazenza Gakona, and they passed unharmed into Natal. They traveled more or less the same route that Smith and Berg had taken two years earlier. The trek avoided the coastal route, keeping to the flatter inland terrain. The commissie track approached Port Natal from East Griqualand and Itkopo, crossing the upper regions of the Mtamvuna and Umkomazi rivers. Travel was slow due to the rugged terrain, and since it was the summer, the rainy season had swollen many of the rivers to their maximum. Progress required days of scouting to locate the most suitable tracks to negotiate. Eventually, after weeks of extraordinary toil, the small party arrived at Port Natal, crossing the Kongela River and weaving their way through the coastal forest into the bay area. They had now traveled a distance of about 650 kilometers or 400 miles from Grahamstown. This trip would have taken about five to six months with their slow moving wagons. The Drakensberg route via Kerkenberg into Natal had not yet been discovered. They arrived at the sweltering hot bay of Port Natal in February 1835, exhausted after their long journey. There, the track was soon welcomed with open arms by the few British hunters and ivory traders there, such as James Collis, including Reverend Alan Francis Gardiner, an ex-commander of the Royal Navy ship Clinker, who had decided to start a mission station there. After congenial exchanges between the Boers and the British sides, the party joined them and invited Dick King to become their guide. The Boers set up their lager or wagon fort camp in the area of the present-day Gravel Racecourse in Durban, chosen because it had suitable grazing for the oxen and the horses and was far from the foraging hippos in the bay. Several small streams running off the Berea Ridge provided fresh water. Alexander Bigger, who was also at the bay as a professional elephant hunter, provided the trekkers with information regarding conditions at Port Natal. Bankies made notes suggested by Ace, which later formed the basis of his more comprehensive report on the prospective aspects of Natal. Bankies Bankies also made rough maps of the bay, although his journal is now missing, showing the potential for a harbour which could supply the Boers in their new homeland. At Port Natal, Ace sent Dick King, who could speak Zulu, to Umgungundlovu to investigate with King Dingani the possibility of granting them land. When Dick King returned to Port Natal some weeks later, he reported that Dingani insisted they visit him in person. Johannes Ace, brother of Pete Ace, and a number of comrades with a few wagons traveled toward King Dingane's capital at Mgungundlovu and after making a lager camp at the mouth of the Mvoti River, they proceeded on horseback but were halted by a flooded Tugela River and forced to return to the lager. The commissie track left Port Natal for Grahamstown with a stash of ivory in early June 1835, following more or less the same route back to the Cape and arrived at Grahamstown in October 1835. On Pete Ace's recommendation, 
Beinke set to work on the first draft of the Natalia Land report. Meetings and talks took place in the main church to much approval and the first sparks of trek fever began to take hold from all the information accumulated at Port Natal. Beinkis drew up the final report on Natalia or Natal Land that acted as the catalyst which inspired the Boer at the Cape to set in motion the Great Trek. I want to thank you very much for watching. This is definitely not the end and if you're enjoying this please hit the like button. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell and YouTube will let you know as soon as our next video is released. Stay safe and stay strong.